Good morning and welcome to the United Rentals Investor Conference Call. Please be advised that this call is being recorded. Before we begin, please note that the company's press release, comments made on today's call, and responses to your questions contain forward-looking statements. The company's business and operations are subject to a variety of risks and uncertainties, many of which are beyond its control, and consequently, actual results may differ materially from those projected. A summary of these uncertainties is included in the safe harbor statement contained in the company's press release. For a more complete description of these and other possible risks, please refer to the company's annual report on Form 10-K for the year ended December 31, 2022, as well as to subsequent filings with the SEC. You can access these filings on the company's website at www.unitedrentals.com. Please note that United Rentals has no obligation and makes no commitment to update or publicly release any revisions to forward-looking statements in order to reflect new information or subsequent events circumstances, or changes in expectations. You should also note that the company's press release and today's call include references to non-GAAP terms such as free cash flow, adjusted EPS, EBITDA, and adjusted EBITDA. Please refer to the back of the company's recent investor presentations to see the reconciliation from each non-GAAP financial measure to the most comparable GAAP financial measure. Speaking today for United Rentals is Matt Flannery, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Ted Gray, Chief Financial Officer. I will now turn the call over to Mr. Flannery. Mr. Flannery, you may begin. Thank you, Operator, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our call. As you've heard us say since the beginning of the year, 2023 is about raising the bar off of last year's record results and our second quarter performance across growth, profitability, and returns provides evidence of that. I'm pleased with how the year is playing out, including the Ahern integration, which remains on track. Of course, key to all of this is our employees, who do an exceptional job supporting our customers every day. Without them, we wouldn't be able to generate the results we consistently deliver. And I'm pleased to report that once again, They've done this with safety at the forefront, as our company-wide recordable rate remained well below one in the second quarter. Importantly, our growth shows that we continue to outpace our underlying markets as we leverage our competitive advantages to provide a superior level of customer service. So let's dig into the results. Total revenue rose by 28% year-on-year to a second quarter record of almost $3.6 billion. Within this, rental revenue grew 21% as reported, with broad-based demand across verticals, regions, and customer segments, while fleet productivity increased 2.1% on a pro forma basis. Adjusted EBITDA increased 29% to a second quarter record $1.7 billion, driving solid margin expansion. Adjusted EPS grew by 26% to a second quarter record of $9.88, and critically, Our return on invested capital set another new high water mark at 13.4%. In short, we're on track for another record year driven by robust customer activity. And the increases to our full year guidance reflect our continued confidence in customer demand. Used equipment sales were another highlight in the quarter. We generated a record second quarter proceeds of $382 million. The retail market remains very strong And we also broadened our channel mix, as we discussed we would last quarter. Combined with the improvements we've seen across most of the supply chain, this has allowed us to refresh our fleet by rotating some of the older assets out. As you saw, rental CapEx totaled $1.25 billion in the quarter, in line with our expectations and helping to ensure that we have the capacity our customers need to support their projects today and going forward. And as I alluded to earlier, the integration of Ahern remains on track. The teams have come together especially well, and our second quarter results reflect the ongoing improvements in the efficiency of their business. And at this point, we're focused on optimizing the combined branch network and fleet 
which should be completed by year end. Now let's take a closer look at the second quarter demand. Key verticals saw broad-based growth, led by industrial manufacturing, metals and minerals, and power. Non-res construction was also up double digits. Within this, our customers kicked off new projects across the board, including numerous EV plants and semiconductor plants, solar power facilities, infrastructure projects, and for the Buffalo Bill fans out there, a new stadium. Geographically, we saw growth in all of our regions on both a reported and pro forma basis. And our specialty business delivered another excellent quarter with rental revenue up 17% year-on-year organically and double-digit gains across all major categories. Within specialty, we opened 19 new locations in the second quarter and are on track for the 40 cold starts this year. Turning to capital allocation, we returned over $350 million to shareholders during the quarter through share buybacks, and dividends are on track to return over $1.4 billion of cash to shareholders this year. And our balance sheet remains in excellent shape. Looking ahead to 2020, 2023 is on track to be another record year across a variety of KPIs, including revenue, EBITDA, EPS, and returns. We're encouraged by the customer sentiment and external indicators which point to growth and give us confidence in our updated guidance. For example, the ABC's Contractor Confidence Index remained strong across the second quarter, as did its Backlog Index. The Dodge Momentum Index was up 19% year-over-year in June, while non-res construction employment growth also remained solid. And most importantly, our own Customer Confidence Index continues to reflect their optimism. Beyond 2023, we remain positive on the longer-term outlook, driven by key tailwinds including infrastructure, industrial manufacturing, and energy and power. As we shared at our Investor Day in May, we spent the last decade building unique and diverse capabilities that position us very well for the $2 trillion-plus of construction projects underpinned by these tailwinds over the next decade. Put simply, our advantages across scale, complex solutions, technology, and people put us in a first-call position. We believe this provides a platform for leveraging our resilient business model and pursuing continued growth, both organically and through M&A. Finally, I want to highlight our new sustainability report, which we released yesterday. While there's a lot of great content in that report that we're very proud of, this year I'd especially point out to the work our team's done quantifying how the rental business model aligns with key aspects of sustainability. For example, less equipment needs to be manufactured because of rental, which has clear benefits, while the equipment that we have in our fleet also helps our customers reduce their emissions intensity based on its younger age and greater fuel efficiency. And not only does this benefit our customers, we believe that it also benefits our employees, the communities we're operating in, and our shareholders. Before I hand the call over to Ted, I'll sum up today by saying I'm very pleased with how the year is playing out. We entered 2023 with high expectations, and as you can see through our results, that's what we're delivering. We feel good about the rest of the year and what's ahead for United Rentals and our investors. And with that, I'll hand the call over to Ted before we open the line for Q&A. Ted, over to you. Thanks, Matt, and good morning, everyone. As you saw in our second quarter release, our team produced strong results that were consistent with our expectations and keep us on track for another record year. And as we shared at our investor day, we continue to feel very good about our prospects beyond 2023 based on the tailwinds we've discussed extensively. One quick reminder before I jump into the numbers, as usual, the figures I'll be discussing are as reported, except where I call them out as pro forma, which are adjusted to include Ahern's standalone results from last year. So with that said, let's get into the details. Second quarter rental revenue was a record $2.98 billion. That's a year-over-year increase of $519 million, or 21%, supported by diverse strengths across our end markets. Within rental revenue, OER increased by $443 million, or 22%. Our average fleet size increased by 25.5%, providing a $514 million benefit, which was partially offset by a decline in as-reported fleet productivity 
of 2%, or $41 million, and our usual fleet inflation of 1.5%, or $30 million. Also within rental, ancillary revenues were higher by $75 million, or 19.3%, and re-rent provided an additional $1 million. I'll note that on a pro forma basis, rental revenue was up a robust 12.4% year-over-year, and fleet productivity increased 2.1% as industry discipline continues, continues to support a healthy rate environment. Turning to used results, our second quarter revenue increased 133% to $382 million as we continue to return to more normalized volumes, while our second quarter adjusted used margin of 57.3% reflected healthy pricing. Notably, as we said we would, we've expanded our channel mix to support these higher used volumes. During the quarter, retail accounted for 65% of our mix, consistent with its longer-term proportion versus 90% last year. Within the shift, we doubled our retail volume and remains a very strong demand environment. Moving to EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA for the quarter was just under $1.7 billion, another second quarter record, reflecting an increase of $384 million, or 29%. The dollar change includes a $310 million increase from rental, within which OER contributed $298 million, ancillary added $15 million, and re-rent was down $3 million. Outside of rental, used sales added $117 million to adjust EBITDA, while other non-rental lines of businesses contributed another $8 million. SG&A increased $51 million due primarily to increases in variable costs, such as higher commissions. As a percentage of sales, however, SG&A declined 180 basis points year-on-year to a second-quarter record low of 10.6% of total revenue. So nice efficiency there. Looking at second-quarter profitability, our adjusted EBITDA margin increased 40 basis basis points on an as-reported basis and increased 130 basis points on a pro forma basis to 47.7%. This translates to an as-reported flow-through of 49% and pro forma flow-through of better than 54%. And finally, adjusted EPS increased 26% to a second quarter record of $9.88. Shifting to CapEx, gross rental CapEx was $1.25 billion and net rental CapEx was $869 million. This represents an increase of $161 million in net CapEx year-over-year, supporting our continued growth in 2023. Year-to-date, gross CapEx has totaled roughly $2.05 billion. This equates to about 60% of the midpoint of our full-year rental CapEx guidance, which is where we expect it to be at this time of the year. Turning to return on invested capital and free cash flow, ROIC, which as you know is a critical metric for us, at a new record at 13.4% on a trailing 12-month basis. That's a 30 basis points sequentially and 190 basis points year-on-year and remains well above our weighted average cost of capital. Free cash flow also remains a good story, with the quarter coming in at $340 million or a trailing 12-month free cash margin of 12.3%, all while continuing to fund significant growth. Moving to the balance sheet, our net leverage ratio at the end of the quarter improved to an all-time low of 1.8 times, or a decline of 10 basis points sequentially and 20 basis points year over year. And our liquidity at the end of June exceeded $2.7 billion with no long-term maturities until 2027. Notably, this was after returning $352 million to shareholders in the quarter, including $250 million through share repurchases and $102 million via dividends. So let's look forward and talk about our increased guidance, which reflects our continued confidence that 2023 will be a record year. Total revenue is now expected in the range of 14 to $14.3 billion, implying a $200 million increase at midpoint and full-year growth of around 21.5% and pro forma growth of roughly 13.5%. Within total revenue, our used sales guidance is now implied at around $1.45 billion, or an increase of $150 million, reflecting better-than-expected pricing and stronger-than-expected retail demand. We've increased our guidance for adjusted EBITDA by $100 million at midpoint to a range of $6.75 to $6.9 billion. 
This continues to imply as reported flow through of around 48% and pro forma flow through in the mid 50s. On the fleet side, we've narrowed our growth capex range by $50 million to between $3.35 and $3.55 billion. Given the increase in our used sales expectations, this now implies net capex between $1.9 and $2.1 billion. And finally, we are increasing our free cash flow guidance by $175 million at midpoint to between $2.3 and $2.5 billion, which is before repurchases and dividends that together should return over $1.4 billion of cash to our investors, or better than $20 per share. So with that, let me turn the call over to the operator for Q&A. Operator, please open the line. Todd, are you there? Todd, can you hear us? Apologies. We'll now take your questions. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one. You may remove yourself from the queue by pressing star two. We'll take our first question from David Rosso with Evercore ISI. Um, I just wonder if you could help us with how you're thinking about fleet productivity the rest of the year and, and maybe a little more color on what drove the pro forma decline from 5.9 down to 2 for the second quarter. Sure, Dave. It's Matt. How are you doing? Um, so as far as what drove the pro forma down, I mean, it's the, 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 we're, we're pleased with the pro forma being up 2.1%. We, we understand some of the concern out there, and is is that telling the the street something? So I'll be clear. I'll be clear about a few things since we don't actually give you the whole numbers. We said we talked to you qualitatively about it. This is not a demand or a rate issue. The the industry still remains in really good shape. I think you're seeing that through the others that report the actual numbers. Rates rate environment is strong, and frankly, the discipline in the industry is strong, and demand is uh, is supporting that. So that's first off. This is really a time issue for us. We made the decision to front load fleet this year to tampen down the very, very aggressive time utilizations we've been running, frankly, for a couple of years. Uh, and, and we didn't really think it was responsive to our customers' needs. And we were doing a little bit too much hand to mouth, putting, uh, putting big relationships at risk. We weren't comfortable with that. So we front loaded our fleet. You remember back in fourth quarter last year. And that's on top of bringing in the Ahern fleet. Um, we're very pleased uh, of, of how it's working out. And just to put it in context, although I'm not going to re revert to giving back whole numbers, our actual time utilization in Q2 was higher than pre-COVID averages and higher than the last time we gave you guys uh, time utilization in 2019. So this is still strong time utilization, just compared to the very frothy, almost uh, inflated time use that we ran last year because we couldn't get the fleet timely enough, um, it's, it's dragging a comp issue, and that's, that's all this is. And regarding the rest of the year, how should we think about year-over-year -year fleet productivity that's baked into the guide? Yeah, I think you'll see these dynamics play through in Q3, similar to what they did in, in Q2. We'll, we'll continue to have seasonal build, but there was seasonal build in the comps as well. So we think these dynamics will play through, and um, – you know, we're very comfortable. We, we, we continue to see a strong rate environment. We continue to, we'll continue to bring in fleet to support this demand in Q3. And uh, so we think the dynamics will be similar. So, so if the fleet productivity is similar in the back half of the year as the second quarter, where does that leave you at the end of the year as we think about 24? You, you made a comment just now about time you on a historical basis is still sort of above above average. Is that how you see the full year time? You just trying to think about your confidence in starting the conversations for rates for 24. Where are we exiting? You know, our thoughts on this time you level versus history. Yeah, and well, to I'm be clear, we want we don't want to get into forecasting ahead that far. But I will tell you, when we said this in May at the investor day, we do view 24 as a growth year. And if you do the math on the capital guide we gave and and where we started the year, we're going to start the year with more more fleet to, to support growth. We do think the end markets will come out of an exit rate this year 
at strong, you know, strong end market demand. We still believe that. So, and then from there, we'll build up our plan through our planning process towards the end of this year. We'll build up what we what we think we need from uh, more growth capex. We do expect that we'll continue. This will be a more normalized replacement capex. You're seeing that in this quarter as well. We expect to do that next year as well. We want to replace, you know, somewhere around 10 to 12 percent of our fleet per year, and I think this new number puts us right in the center of that of that uh, target. David, this is Ted. The one thing I might add is Matt made the comment about second quarter time use relative to history. Just to be clear, for the full year, we would expect the same to be true. Relative to history, 2023 will be a strong time use year. Okay, that, that, that's helpful. And on the rest of the year guide, the implied, I'm talking reported, the implied mm-hmm. EBITDA margins are down a little bit from the second half of last year. But in the first half of this year, your EBITDA margins were 50 bips higher than a year ago. So just curious why the margins would be down year over year in the second half, but having been up in the first half of this year. Yeah, so I'd say a couple things there, David. Um, one, we, we always caution people against anchoring to the midpoint, but AHERN is really kind of the factor that people need to be thinking about as they think about first half and second half dynamics year on year. Um, you know, we, we've been clear to talk about pro forma flow through in the mid 50s. We've been delivering that, and we would expect that to be true in the back half of this year, which will be driving margin expansion on a pro forma basis. Which, as Matt said, is the way we think about our business. And, and last quick one. Sorry to hog the call here. Apologies. But your implied free cash flow the rest of the year and your EBITDA, it would imply that the leverage, the financial leverage at the end of the year, is at one six. So to get back to even the low end of your target of two to three for leverage would imply you you have about two point eight billion dollars to put to work just to get to the low end. Just curious how you're thinking about deploying that. And again, that already counts for five hundred million repo the rest of the year and a couple hundred million of dividends. So this is above and beyond that. Thank you. Correct, it does. And this is one of the things we've been working on internally, and we'll work on it further as the year progresses. Um, for 2023, kind of our, our allocation of capital is committed, as you know. As it relates to next year, we will have decisions to make, um, and certainly we'll have an update for where we end up come January, I would expect. But we're left with a couple options, and we've talked about these publicly. Um, on one hand, you know, there's the potential that we could lower the range, which is something we talked about when we introduced the new capital allocation strategy in 2019, um, or you could – you know, keep it where it is. That's one of the things we're working on, trying to figure out what's the best way to allocate capital to drive shareholder value. So there's not much more specific I can add right now, but certainly, um, you know, that's how we're thinking about it. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Rob Wertheimer with Melius Research. Uh, hi. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I had a question on Ahern and just the maturation of acquisitions in general. And I know you talk about how you sort of scramble the egg and you can't always unscramble it, but I assume that you've still got some ongoing repair and maintenance as you sort of fix up a fleet that was presumably underinvested in. And then I assume there's also a process just because you guys have so much well, you have so much process. You have so many uh, SKUs and so forth of training people up and so forth. So I just wonder if you have any comments on how long – or how big that margin differential is and how that, that uh, you know, that maturation of that acquisition uh, drags up margins. Are we there now, or is it going to take two or three years? Is it going to be, you know, a tailwind for two or three years, or any commentary around that would be helpful? Sure, Rob. It's Matt. Um, so to your point, you know, it, it, it takes time to get everything done. We always start with the people, first and foremost, make sure we secure everybody, get them comfortable with their jobs, and then we train them on the systems, make sure everybody's working off the same operating system. All that's been done. So that's the front end and always is in any deal we do. From there, we start working through the fleet, and then any kind of branch changes, whether they're consolidations, uh, whether we're repurposing any facilities. And we'll continue to work through fleet and facilities through the balance of this year. Um, so, you know, we've got the game plan. It's just a matter of, of execution, and uh, we're working through that. Then as far as margins and the maturation, I'll let Ted talk to it. But I wouldn't expect us to be fully mature, certainly by year one. We've done some work in this in the past with, with other deals, but Ted, you may want to answer the call. Yeah, Rob, it's, it's a good question, and, and it kind of gets to some of the margin dynamics in the quarter that this is a good chance to kind of get those out there. So if you were to look at the equipment rental 
gross margin. On an as-reported basis, it would look like it was down 140 basis points year on year. Um, that's a slight improvement from the down 170 in the first quarter. So you can see some of those benefits playing through there. But importantly, uh, on a pro forma basis, our gross margin actually expanded 20 basis points. So you can see that impact of Ahern just putting the year-ago period into the numbers. Um, so we've got margin expansion there. And if you adjust for the increase in depreciation related to the uh, asset, uh, the valuation of the acquired assets, gross margins were actually up 80 basis points in the equipment metal uh, gross margin line. That includes the drag that we're talking about from this ongoing investment in fleets, which we've talked about last quarter, continuing this quarter. I think it's reasonable to it'll, you know, uh, continue in the second half as we get that fleet up to our standards. And other investments we're making that do get expensed in things like facilities. So to us, things are playing out very well, even as, in spite of these additional costs that are um, hitting us from a P&L perspective. And you can see that in these numbers I just shared. Okay, perfect. And if I can sneak in one more, I guess the normalization, excuse me, the normalization of supply chain means you and others are able to get fleet kind of more when you want it versus when you thought. Um, and, you know, maybe some of that plus some of the, the better margins you're getting on, on uh, sale use equipment has led to the net rental capex coming in a little bit. Um, any relation of that to end market demand? I mean, are you still seeing strength in every vertical and every everything? Is there any tie between uh, those two those two ideas? Thanks, and I'll stop there. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So, so first off, um, let's be clear: the supply chain is not fully remedied, which is why we front load capex so much in the first half of this year, right? So we're at the at sixty percent of our full year spend. We're at the top end of the range we had talked about in that fifty five to sixty, and if we could have pulled in some more up front in specific categories, we probably would have. We had said in the beginning of the year, we didn't really think there was an opportunity to pull CapEx forward. That This is a decision that probably we'd make in Q4 if we were going to raise CapEx. That would really have to say more about what next year's slots look like and if we can get back to more normalized cadence when the supply chain hopefully remedies uh, in its entirety. So this change in net CapEx is just strictly about us having the opportunity to sell more fleet through the retail channel. And we're talking 90-month-old fleet at, you know, seven cents on the dollar. It's just, just smart business. It's time for that stuff to rotate out, and we wanted to normalize that. So there, if we could have pulled some more forward to maybe make that net CapEx number more whole, we may have done it in the right categories. We just, we just didn't really have that option because the supply chain's getting better, but not 100% there yet. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Stephen Fisher with UBS. Thanks. Good morning. So I understand that uh, some of the, the lower utilization you're seeing is by design because you're running too hot and your product availability wasn't where you wanted it to be to, to serve some of those key customers you mentioned. But would you say you know, to what extent are your service levels now back to where you like them to be and so that sort of intentional lower utilization is, is now run its course, or do you still think, you know, you need to have more uh, more slack in the system by design? No, I, I think we're at a comfortable level. Listen, we, we want to continue to improve utilization over the long-term trend. It was just we haven't had a normal year in three years, right? So when you think about the COVID year, which was just goofy overall, and then the two years of just not being able to get fleet at the proper cadence, um, we'll revert back to, continuing to try to drive better metrics from 19 on, as we had always done. So I'm not saying we're capped out. I'm just saying right now, uh, with, especially with, with continuing to work through the Ahern fleet, we're on a pretty healthy time utilization, and we are being able to be responsive to these, these major opportunities we have with big customers on big projects. So that's how I, I categorize that, Steve. Okay, that's helpful. And then... In terms of the rental gross margin trajectory, so you had a 170 basis point year-over-year decline in Q1 on the reported basis and 140 basis points in, in Q2, uh, so a little narrower decline. Should we extrapolate that pace uh, or should that drag get smaller at a faster pace and maybe even really kind of just ends this year and so that, you know, by the start of next year, you're 
you're growing your, your gross margins on a year-over-year basis. How should we think about that sort of trajectory? Yeah, so we do our best not to guide to kind of uh, gross margins, but, but certainly directionally we would expect it to continue heading in the right direction. There's going to be a gap there structurally because that was a less profitable business um, than what we would have on a legacy basis, right? So and we've, we've talked about that. I think on an LTM basis, their EBITDA margins were 35%, whereas ours were 48%. Um, and so that will obviously be a dynamic in these as-reported numbers, but certainly um, – that gap should narrow, and then as we get to next year, I think it would definitely be reasonable to assume that we'd be looking for margin expansion across the business. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Seth Weber with Wells Fargo Securities. Uh, hey, guys. Good morning. Um, maybe, Ted, just, just following up on your um, margin co- comment answer, um, you know, SG&A was surprisingly good this quarter. You know, it was down sequentially on a dollar basis, great great leverage um, as a percentage of revenue. Can you – is there still more operating leverage to come on the SG&A line uh, for the company here going forward, or is this as good as it gets? Um, so here, again, this is an example of things we don't typically guide towards, so I want to be careful there. It's all embedded within the EBITDA <coughs> – EBITDA and EBITDA margin and flow through guidance we've given. So certainly we would expect to continue driving very good efficiency there, but in terms of kind of trying to give people more precise handholding, it's just not something we've uh, we've done. So I, I don't know if that helps, uh, Seth, but, but we feel really good about it, and certainly we would expect to continue to be very efficient. Okay. Um, any, Matt, just to you know, appreciate all the color on the, you know, the, you know town you and all, all that stuff. Maybe just a bigger picture question on the industry supply. Um, you know, we've heard from a few different, uh, some of your competitors have reported recently, some, some companies are raising CapEx, some are moderating CapEx. You know, can you just talk to what you think uh, kind of industry supply looks like, industry utilization looks like, um, yeah, just leave it there, I guess. Yeah, I, I think – so let's talk about the large companies, which which we all get a little more um, uh, information from. I think we're in a similar boat. I think you'll hear from most of them that this is still a good demand environment, still a good solid rate environment, and I think that points to the industry discipline. And I think – not everybody's reported yet, but I think everybody's had the same challenge of that time you was just running a little too hot, and I think you're seeing people remedy that. I think a lot of us that had the ability to, so specifically the big guys that had some scale to leverage, um, front loaded their capital to try to bring it in to bring it in ahead of the demand curve, so you didn't get stuck in that same box we were in for the last year or two. So I, I, I think the dynamics of the industry are really solid, and I think you're going to hear we already have heard you know a couple report similar trends to what we're talking about. So we think the industry is in good shape. We think supply demand is in good shape historically strong time utilizations, and uh, and that it's a, it's a solid rate environment. So good all the way around. Got it. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Seth. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Jerry Revich with Goldman Sachs. Yes, hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, morning. Hey, Jerry. Man, uh, yeah. I'm wondering if we just expand on, on that comment you, you made a moment, moment ago. So if we look back, you know, 2015, 16, where there was a, a time utilization soft spot and rising used equipment inventories and new equipment inventories, um, you know, the industry gave back some price. And what we're seeing from you folks and others is actually better price in 2Q than, than in 1Q. So can you just – Talk about the distinctions now versus then. How big of a factor is um, the availability of uh, Rouse market by market information? I- any other significant distinctions that are driving the much better industry discipline uh, today versus um, seven years ago? Sure. Well, to be specific, if you remember that 2015 was that oil and gas dislocation, right? Which really drove kind of a double dip, we'll call, of rate problem because it was the highest value of rate in just about every company's portfolio that was serving it. Rates were really high there, and it went away quickly uh, across the board. But your point is still fair. 
that was what happened when there was too much fleet in the system. The time use then dropped to levels that made people have to make different decisions. The time use now in the industry is very healthy. So even though it's dropped from inflated time utilization, the reason why you're seeing different behavior is part industry discipline, but also everybody's running at healthy time utilizations. People are able to make good returns, good margins at these utilization levels, and, uh, and, and the price of goods is higher, so people understand the necessity for rate. So I, I think it's a totally different dynamic, and that's important to note because some people may be reading through the drop in time utilizations that are reported is a demand problem. That's not the case whatsoever. So it, it, thanks for helping make that point. Uh, and in, in terms of just, just the natural implication of that, right, if we're not going to be looking to gear up in, in the first quarter as hard uh, as an industry in 24, uh, obviously you're not giving 24 guidance yet, but just the implication of that is lower year-over-year CapEx for the industry in the first half of 24, just mathematically to tie all that together given how hot we're running in the first half of 23. Is that a reasonable way to uh, pull these pieces together? Uh, maybe normalized cadence. I wouldn't say lower, but we're not even sure of that yet, right? We've got to get these slots from the OEMs. They have to be able to make the commitments. I know they're working hard. I know you talk to these folks as well. They're hopeful. That's supply chain will remedy. But uh, I, I wouldn't go all the way there yet, but hopefully. Hopefully that's what happens and we can get, you know, a little more of a normalized cadence and not have to hold stuff through the winter because we're afraid we can't get it in the spring. But either way, we're going to do what we need to do for our customers, right? Not not manage the metric more than the business and the output through the P&L. Uh, appreciate the discussion. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question will come from Jamie Cook with Credit Suite. Good morning and nice quarter. Um, I mean, most of my questions have been asked, but first, just on, you know, what your customers are saying about 2024 and the implications for how their uh how it'll work with you going forward so if we have you know above average visibility do they want to lock in you know um uh lock in business with you earlier and have sort of longer term contracts to make sure um you know they're able to to capitalize on the multi-year spend that's out there or with supply chains getting better do you feel like customers potentially could get less sticky because they know there's going to be more equipment out there in the market and then my second question um, specialty margins continue to, you know, improve, you know, year over year. I'm assuming that's the trajectory for the back half of the year. And is there any opportunity, um, you know, on the m and front and specialty that would be uh, more in it? Thank you. I'll take the first part of that, Jamie, and, and Ted could talk to the specialty uh, side. So big customers are still concerned, especially major projects, still concerned about making sure they have surety of supply. Right, even though it's a small amount of spend, right, a couple of percentage points to spend on the project, it has major implications when they can't get the, the material and, and the labor uh, activated. So we're having those conversations, and a lot of the projects we're talking about today kick off this year and will carry in through next year, and they all hit different phases. So we're in regular planning with our with our large customers on these mega projects because it's it's really important to them, and they they felt the crunch over the last couple of years. And they want to make sure that uh, surety of supply is there. So you, you, it's definitely more that way than, than thinking they can wait. I think the last two years, in some ways, is better for us planning more with our big customers because they realize it's an important it's an important factor to making sure we both have a win-win situation. And Ted, you want to touch on the second part? Yeah, quickly, Jamie. I just want to be sure I understood the, the questions because it sounded like there are three. Matt answered the first. I heard the second half margins. I didn't know if that was a general question or specific to specialty. And the third, it sounded like the outlook for specialty M&A. Yeah, it was specific. The question was specific to specialty, both in terms of margin and both in terms of M&A opportunity. Um, so here again, you know, it's all kind of embedded in the guidance we've given. So we do our best not to get into kind of giving specific guidance by segment or, or unit. So um, certainly – you know, as we, you've heard us say, we feel very good about the way the business is performing and the outlook for margins in the second half, and that would be true on both sides of the business. Not sure I can be any more specific. In terms of the outlook for M&A, both broadly and within specialty, it remains a very robust market. Um, we've, you know, we, you've seen kind of what we've done year to date, and we continue to be active um, shoppers. 
Um, in terms of, you know, success, that's harder to say. Uh, discipline is always job number one for us when we're allocating capital. So, you know, we're, we're hopeful and optimistic that we'll have uh, some things to do in the back half in m and more generally, but certainly within specialty as well. Um, Matt, anything you'd add on that front? No, no, I think you covered it. I mean, we, we all, you folks all know we're very, we're very acquisitive and opportunistic, but we're going to make sure it meets that, uh, that high bar that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tim Fine with Citigroup. Thanks. Uh, good morning. I just uh, first to Matt, I wanted to, to follow up on the, the earlier discussion on, on fleet productivity. I, I realize you don't love dissecting all these pieces, but I, I just wanted to uh, to follow up just from a mix perspective. You know, as, as you talk about, I, I realize there, there are multiple you know, pieces and components that go into that. But as you, as, you know, as you cycle more of that Ahern fleet out of the business um, and, and you're refreshing the fleet as you talked about, does that continue to be, presumably that's, um, you know, just get, given the inflation that we've seen recently in that product category that they were so big in, in, in aerials, does that act as a, as a headwind um, you know, into 24, or or just, and again, I, I know we're not, I'm not looking for, you know, super granularity on this, but I'm just thinking from a high level, that does that continue to, to drag on, on that fleet productivity, or, or does that start to fade away? No, not, not, not more significant than what we deal with in our own fleet, right? So we're always going to manage inflation. That's why we track fleet productivity. But I, I think you'd have to imagine that our buying power was a little bit better. So some of those OECs, and that's why you have part of the difference between as reported and pro forma. Some of those OECs are a little pumped up a little higher than ours. They didn't buy as well as us. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there as a replace. So it won't be incrementally, the replacement won't be incrementally as high as it would be maybe on one of our old assets, our own assets that was, you know, nine years old or eight years old. So nothing that we're call out, nothing that we can't manage through in the normal course of business. Okay. All right. And, and then maybe just to get a bigger picture, you know, a, a fair amount of disruption, you know, that's occurred to the, the regional or the, you know, banking system over the last several months. And, you know, there's more concerns around just lending availability and, and just some of these regional banks tighten up. Again, not, nothing that you haven't heard. But I'm, I'm just curious, as your conversations with, you know, fellow, you know, C-suite, folks, is that, are you hearing or seeing much from the standpoint of, you know, projects that, that maybe were on your drawing board that are pushing out or anything that you would flag, you know, along those lines? Obviously, it's been a concern for some, you know, recently. I'm just curious if that, if it's something that, that you're seeing or hearing much about. Thanks. No, as a matter of fact, our, our project pipeline remains robust. We're not, we're not seeing cancellations. We talked about delays on some solar projects that was more supply chain related, and we actually think those are coming back on uh, quicker than they were, which is good news. But when we look at mega projects overall, right, and you can decide how you define a mega project. Is it whether it's 400 million, 500 million, 600 million worth of value? These are all up significantly, and we're talking, you know, depending on which cut you use, somewhere between 70 and, and over 100 percent. So doubling the size of these amount of projects and and, and that's what the pipeline looks like right now. So we actually feel really good about the pipeline. We haven't seen any deterioration because of uh, any kind of, uh, of, of financing or, or interest issues. Ted, you might want to add something. Yeah, Tim, I guess the things I'd add, you said regional banks, but I think it's more specific to the local smaller banks. But, frankly, we're not seeing it at either level. I mean, as best we can tell, capital availability remains abundant for our customers. Cost of capital remains reasonable. Um, and so if we look at our customer confidence, really going back to the middle of March when all this started, it's, it's really unaffected. Um, and if we look at our performance by customer segment, right, so you look at national account, strategic, assigned, local, et cetera, uh, you're not seeing any real difference in how those are performing. So certainly on a, you know, through the second quarter, there's no discernible impact. And in terms of what the potential may be going forward, our customers aren't really talking about it, and we're not sensing it's an issue, but it's something we're obviously watching uh, closely, as you'd expect. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Tim.
Thank you. We'll take our next question from Ken Newman with Key Bank Capital Markets. Hey, good morning, guys. Hey, Ken. Uh, Matt, so obviously it sounds like you feel very confident uh, in the demand environment here. Um, I am curious if you just give a little bit of color uh, on what you're seeing between your two customer sets, right? Because obviously your internal uh, your internal sentiment survey seems like it's still pretty strong or in line with last quarter, uh, which is I think more tied to your national accounts. But any signs of uh, you know material moves between your national accounts and your local accounts? Uh, no, not, not anything that we're seeing now. You know, we don't do, you know, a lot of Harry homeowner type weekend warrior type work. So I, I don't know what that segment's doing. We definitely skew more towards the contractor and, and large contractor, but we're not seeing any delineation in our local market business versus our big job business. We're actually in pretty good shape. We talked about that when we were talking about the non-res numbers earlier. So we're, uh, that's one of the areas where you would think it would show up and it's not. We're actually not seeing any delineation and we're not seeing it in the customer confidence index. Uh, results as well. Got it. And then, you know, just to, to follow up on that non-res comment, you know, obviously you talked about industrial manufacturing demand being strong here in the quarter. Non-res, I think you said, was up double digits. I'm curious if you could just dissect that a little bit. I mean, I didn't hear too much about civil infrastructure projects. My understanding is that's starting to accelerate here in these last couple of months. Is that a, a category that you're expecting to accelerate here into the back half? And if so, how do we think about the margin impact on some of those projects, if any, uh, here for, uh, you know, the back half of 23? Yeah, Ken, I'll take that one. So it, it's not one of those things that's easy to track, as you know. I would say intuitively, yes, we do expect a lot of the civil projects that are funded by the infrastructure bill and, and prospectively the Inflation Reduction Act to start gaining momentum. In terms of exactly what that cadence looks like, it would be great if there were a schedule. We have not found one, but certainly the, the outlook for infrastructure um, is positive, right? You've got north of $1.5 trillion of spend over the next 10 years, let's say, um, and spend that we are very well positioned for, given Matt had made this comment in his prepared remarks, but the strategy we've developed over the last 10 years is unique and puts us in a great position to be the most value-added partner to the contractors that are executing those projects. Thanks, Ken. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Our next question comes from Scott Sneeberger with Oppenheimer. Uh, thanks, guys. Good morning. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up that last non-res question. A, a common question we feel is about weak spots within non-res. And everything uh, we've heard on this call uh, sounds very, very good uh, across non-res. So one of the areas of concern is, is commercial real estate, you know, non-manufacturing, and, and office buildings. Um, any insight you can share there or any other areas of weakness? Um, Matt, it just sounds like it, it's very broad-based and very good. I just want to hone in on any trouble points that you might be seeing. Yeah, um, no, and I know Ted's done some work on this data. I mean, we all know what the vacancy rates are, and we know those are issues, but I don't know that that was ever a real big part of our business, right? Is vertical versus horizontal is usually a bigger bigger rental need uh, as opposed to vertical, but Ted may have some information to share. Yeah, and certainly if you look at what we call non-res, it, it continues to, to grow quite nicely. We don't get as granular as the questions you're asking. So if you were to look at the construction put-in-place data, Scott, Certainly, you'd look looking at office and commercial, you know, whether it's year-to-date or I think June, which is the most recent data, uh, they both continue to show, show growth. Now, I think you're asking more on a forward-looking basis, and when we think about that, and we have, in total, those two verticals are about 20% of total non-res construction put in place. Um, and, you know, I'd say the office part is one people worry about, given return to office and work from home and those things. Commercial is a huge segment, so it's not strip malls wherever people live. It's, it's much broader. But I think those are the two areas that we've talked about being reasonably at risk. Um, now, then you talk about the areas where we see where we are optimistic, where we see strong pipelines and where, you're, where you continue to see strong growth. And the ones you'd highlight would be manufacturing, as we've talked about. Um, 
public road and highway, power, communication, transportation, and healthcare, um, all of which are performing well. In total, those are 55% of total non-res. And uh, you know, our, our contention would be the growth in those markets is really going to offset any headwinds we would reasonably anticipate in the office commercial combination. So that is, you know, logically what drives our optimism looking out across, you know, the back half of this year and, and going forward. Great. Thanks, Ted. That's the answer I was looking for. Appreciate it. Um, for uh, just a, a quick follow-up, um, specialty rental, could you speak a little bit to the asset categories? Um, it sounds like things have been going very well, and it sounds like that's broad-based as well. But just curious if anyone's lagging behind uh, or at the category or pulling ahead. And um, also any commentary on, on GFN. The old goal was to uh, to double that within five years. Uh, just a, an update now that we're two years past that, the close of that acquisition, where uh, where that stands. Thanks so much. Yeah, no, um, so for the first part of your question, nobody's falling behind. As I said, the prepared remarks, you know, specialty had 17% organic growth, and all the business segments were in double digits, which is great. Now, certainly the GFN, which you pointed to, is growing a little bit faster than the rest, but we would expect that. And uh, as far as that goal to double the size of the business in five years, uh, I think we shared this earlier in the year that we're, we're ahead of schedule. You know, whether we're a year ahead of schedule or two years ahead of schedule, time will tell, but we're, we're very pleased with where they are, and we're continuing to open cold start to continuing to grow uh, that sector as well. But we're growing all of our specialty segments. We're really pleased with uh, the work the team's doing there. Sounds good. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Our next question comes from Neil Tyler with Redburn. Yeah, hi, guys. Um, thank you. Um, Two left, please. Firstly, on the topic of, of CapEx and fleet and availability, one of your competitors floated the notion that um, ticket prices, OEC ticket prices, um, had been sort of inflated recently by um, you know, things like surcharges um, uh, that, you, that, that should or may well fall away if, um, if availability improves. I don't know if that's a perspective. Uh, I'd like to hear your perspective on whether that's a, a likelihood or a certainty or, 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 or not a notion that you, you're considering, first of all, please. Sure. So we, we don't talk about our negotiations on open mic. Uh, just, you know, we we're, we're, want to be good partners with our vendors. But the comment of some of the surcharges and the costs associated with creating those surcharges is certainly a fair comment when we're, we're discussing with our partners. So I don't think that characterization is wrong. We just... We just don't really talk about uh, our negotiations with our partners, uh, uh, you know, publicly. But the characterization is fair one. Great. Thank you. That, no, that's still helpful. Um, and then just um, apologies, but I want to just quickly come back to the time you'd comments you made earlier, just to, so I understand this. You, you know, the, the, the lower year-on-year -year time you'd, you know, splits between a timing of uh, fleet arrivals and the deliberate, you know, um, a, a deliberate move to to um, uh, to normalise time use. And am I right in thinking that the first of those two categories is is more or less behind behind us, um, and that the, the second will persist for the rest of the year? Is that is that fair? Yeah, I mean, the first enabled us to do the second, right? If we didn't bring in the fleet, we wouldn't even be able to tamp it down. So they, they're very much uh, going going hand in hand. But just by definition of how much capital we have left for the year for versus the growth, we're going to bring in a good amount of our CapEx in, in Q3 here, as, as you would expect for the balance of the – what's left of the balance of the year. And, uh, and I, I think, like I said earlier, when people are trying to see if we could forecast the, the productivity number, we'll sequentially grow, but we think you're going to see similar year-over-year -year dynamics to what we saw in Q2. So we feel good about it. We feel good about the demand. And we'll continue to have CapEx roll in here in Q3. Super. That's really helpful. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Our final question comes from Meg Dobre with Baird. Oh, uh, thank you for fitting me in. Good morning. Um, a lot has been covered here, but maybe on the topic of non-res, um, and uh, Ted, appreciated all, all, all the context you provided, but I wanted to sort of ask a hypothetical question. You know, if we're, if we're looking at private non-res this year, uh, the put-in-place is growing north of 20%. If, if growth 
flows in 2024, right? Tougher comps or maybe maybe some of the pockets that uh, 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 weakness that people are worried about. And, you know, we're talking about growth reverting back to low to mid single digits. What does that mean in terms of how you're going to manage your business? How do you, how do you manage fleet in terms of capex, disposals? Uh, and again, I'm not asking for guidance. I'm just trying to understand hypothetically how you would react to something like that. Yeah, it's it's a good question, Megan. It's something we go through every year. So, of course, we're talking in nominal dollars, so you've really got to convert this all to volume. But that's how we approach the forward year as it relates to capex. As we get into the fall and into the fourth quarter, we'll start our bottoms-up planning process. That process will help us get a much better sense for what our customers think their growth will look like at 24. At that point, we can then think about what our replacement CapEx needs will be uh, based on the OEC we plan to sell next year, and then the incremental fleet we need to support growth in that environment. Um, as Matt said, we think we've kind of reset the baseline back to where we want to be this year. So as we think about next year, you know, let's just say we're kind of at that steady state. Then there's less of a time use dynamic that comes into this, and then it's more a function of how do you manage the growth in your OEC. Matt, is that fair? Yeah, no, I, I think you covered it well. Okay. And, and, Does and, that and hypothetically maybe... answer your question? Well, it, 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 it helps. Uh, I'm, I'm still kind of scratching my head on the fact that you're going to be exiting the year with significant year-over-year -year growth in fleet, right? So, you know, if growth slows, does that mean that you're sort of pivoting towards just pure replacement capex, or you're still in, you know, fleet growth mode? That's what I was trying to tease out. Yeah, and, and it's a fair question, but it will depend on what we see as a demand as we go through our planning process. But we're certainly – not as uh, as negative on the growth as maybe your, the tone you're sharing, but you know what? Time will tell, and, and we're going to adjust and manage the business appropriately for whatever environment we have. All that being said, we do expect, and I think you're seeing this with most of the big players, for us to outpace overall industry growth. We think the bigs getting bigger is a dynamic that will continue to play, and I would say the type of work that we've talked a lot about to everyone lends itself to the larger players. So I, I, I wouldn't even, even if there is a slower growth in the overall industry, we think we'll have the ability to out, outpace that. But, uh, but I do get your point, and we'll, we'll manage through it. And that's the thing about doing it year-end is we'll know what that carryover growth and capacity is, which allows us then to factor that into whatever our CapEx spend will be. All right, let's get back to continuing to be very good stewards of our shareholders' capital. Understood. Thank you, gentlemen. You got it, Nick. Thanks. Thank you. At this time, we'll turn the call back over to Matt Flannery for any additional or closing remarks. Thanks, operator. And uh, no additional remarks. That wraps it up for today. So I want to thank everyone for joining us, and we look forward to speaking with you all again in late October. And in the meantime, please feel free to reach out to Elizabeth at any time if you have any questions. Thanks again. Operator, please go ahead and end the call. Thank you. This does conclude today's call. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect at any time.